I see a lot of many, many familiar faces here this morning. And um, let me see the hands again of those of you who are from West Virginia, born and raised. Raise them up big and high. These are my people. Wonderful. And uh, I love, wild and wonderful. Yes, sir. So I'm happy to be among my people. And if you're born again and you're part of God's family, would you raise your hand? Yes. And uh, we're from a city and going to a city whose builder and maker is God. And uh, I'm glad to be again with, with my people. And um, this is the Crown College. And again, these are my people. And I love the Crown College. And I love the Temple Baptist Church. And I'm so thankful for all that the Lord has done here and all that the Lord is doing here. And, you know, these aren't, um, this isn't the end. And uh, there's so much more to be done. I look forward to the days ahead for the Crown College. And I want to thank the staff, Brother Tomlinson, Brother Zinker, and all the staff and faculty who have just continued on. And I love that theme, don't you? Continue. And that's what the Lord has given us to do. And um, I come today just really with a, with a desire to encourage or maybe exhort you. Um, as you sit here as a college student, I think back of my days here as a college student. My freshman year, my dorm, which was what you now call mods. How many of you know what the mods are, right? A modular. They're out at the camp, I think, up on the hill now. But that mod, those mods sat in front of the, what is the auditorium now, in the parking lot. And my freshman semester here uh, woke up every morning to dump trucks, dumping fill dirt where the auditorium sits now, and the beeping of the backing up of the dump trucks and the slamming of the tailgates as they as they emptied the dirt there and watching them erect that building as I was here. And uh, what a blessing to be able to move into that new auditorium. I was looking at the pulpit here in the Christian Heritage Center of Pastor Sexton who preached behind that original pulpit there at the old auditorium. And I remember being in those services there in that packed auditorium, two services and chairs up both sides and the orchestra basically sitting on the platform almost. Uh, choir staying in the choir loft, filled just wonderful days there, but then excited to move into the new auditorium and all that God did there. And as I was graduating, this property was purchased. And I remember Mr. Nicely brought me and a few other guys in here and we turned on these lights and they just came on one after another and I saw how large this room was. And none of these walls were in here, none of these walls. And just a huge, vast, open building. And I thought, man, what God is going to do here in the days ahead. And then to look and see what he is doing. And I'm so encouraged. And I thank, thank Brother Zinker and Brother Tomlinson for the opportunity to be here. And just to speak at my alma mater to you. And I want to help you today. I want to encourage you today in this matter of continuing. And I want to ask you, if you would, to open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 6 with me. Ephesians chapter 6, a familiar passage we'll turn to and look at in just a moment. And I think of so many things as I'm standing here I want to share with you, but I know time wouldn't allow all of it, but I'm just so thankful for what God did in my heart. Thankful for what the Lord did to bring my wife and I together here. Um, and how the Lord put in our hearts some things to do for Him and and. Of course, I'm indebted to Pastor Sexton and all that he did investing in my life. And if you're here, you're a part of that same investment. And uh, he being dead yet speaketh. And we live, he lives if we stand, all of those things. And I still find myself saying things the way that he said them. And um, sometimes you would hear him repeat things. How many of you know what I'm talking about? He would repeat certain things truths in a certain way, and, and you may think at the moment, I've heard him say that before, but when you're 20 years removed from being here, and you can still hear those things in your heart, and now you can say them that way, uh, it's invaluable. It's just invaluable. And I'm so thankful for Pastor Sexton and Mrs. Sexton and the Temple Baptist Church. And I want to encourage you today, and here in Ephesians chapter number 6, a familiar passage We'll begin in verse number 10, and you know this passage, but if you would look, I would like you to notice the first word of verse number 10, finally, 
finally. It's interesting because this is really something we need to pay attention to when someone says, finally, we ought to pay attention to the last thing that they're about to say to us. But the truth of it is, it's, it's not really an ending point. It is a beginning point for us. It's what we must continue to do. He's about to give us these instructions. And he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Would you read with me and follow along in your hearts? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, having done all to stand. Can we pray together? Lord, I do pray, Father, as we enter thy presence, Lord, you would take your holy word, and Lord, would you do what I cannot do? Would you speak to our hearts? Lord, may this be your message, not mine. Lord, I pray that the Word of God would enter into the hearts of these young people in a way that, Lord, you would challenge them and stir them to action, to obedience before Thee. God, I thank You for this great body of students, but believers, Lord, Christian soldiers who are training. And God, I pray that You would put some things in their hearts while they're here as they've been trained in their homes and in their home churches. Lord, I, I pray that you'd put some things in their hearts that they would never, never leave behind, but that they would stand upon. And we ask this in thy son's name, Jesus Christ. And amen. Would you look again with me at verse number 13? I want to draw your attention to a phrase. In the middle of the verse, he says, that ye may be able to withstand. And then look up, if you would, at verse number 11. Another phrase here that I would lay upon your heart. That ye may be able, able to stand. That's what I want to speak on for a few moments this morning is this thought, able to stand. Able to stand. He says again in verse number 13, and having done all to stand. When it is all said and done, the question may be asked, what will be said of you? When it is all said and done, when your story has been told, what will be said of you? Or maybe what will be true of your life? Could this be said of you that you were able to stand? Having done all to stand, there is a pressure, there's a pressure that is coming against all of us to move. There's a pressure to move off of our position where God has placed us as tools, as instruments in His work. There's a pressure against us and a fight against us to move from that position. And if we're not careful, if we're not diligent with what the Scriptures is, is telling us here, we will be moved off of where we once stood. I'm thankful, aren't you, for those who have stood where we now stand? Aren't you thankful for those who down through the ages have stood on the faith, stood firmly? so that we could also come along behind them and stand where they stood. Many of you have faithful parents who are at home praying for you. They have stood. Will you stand where they stand? You have a pastor at home. How many of you can think of your pastor now as I'm speaking? You have a pastor at home who is standing 
And He has stood so that you have a place to stand. And I want you to know that there is a pressure against them. There's a pressure against these men as the Lord has given them this ministry to lead. There's a pressure against them to move. And I know, and I want you to know this morning, there is a pressure against you to move off of your position. The Proverbs tells us to buy the truth and sell it not. Buy it. There's an implication there that it will cost you something. The truth will cost you. If you're going to stand on the truth, it will cost you. But let me tell you, it will be worth every penny. It will be worth everything that you pay or that you give to buy the truth. And it says, and sell it not. Once you have the truth, don't lose it. Hang on to it. Never let go of it. There's nothing more valuable than the truth in your life. Stand on it. May I say stand in it. Don't move. Many of you are young men here standing under my voice. You are the next generation of fathers. Fathers. I know maybe you don't think of that now, but you'll be the fathers who will someday, Lord willing, be able to send your sons and daughters to a place just like this, this, if not this place, wherever the Lord leads them. It wasn't so long ago that I sat in chapel services, that I sat where you sit, hearing preaching like this. And some of you young men, you are the fathers of the next generation. You young ladies, you're the mothers of another generation that is coming after you. Let me ask you this, where will your children be? What will your children have 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I'll tell you what they'll have. I'll tell you where they'll be. They will be where you lead them, and they will have what you give to them. They'll have what you give to them. You can't give them what you don't have. Young people, stand. Stand where you are. Stand on those things that have been given to you. You To stand on the truth. But how will you? How can we? With this pressure that's against us, look at verse number 13 again. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our warfare is not against one another. It's not against other human beings. The pressure that is coming against us is from another realm. It's from a spirit world. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How will you stand against all of this pressure? How will you stand against these powers? The only way you and I will be able to stand, and having done all to stand, is to have a deep understanding of what is said here in Ephesians chapter 6. May I lay three things on your heart this morning. Number one, I want to speak about a call to battle. A call to battle. You see, there is a call here given in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, and he says to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. To be strong in the Lord. There is no room for self-sufficiency as a soldier of the Lord. There's no room for us to say, I've got this, I think I can do this on my own. In fact, the Lord's work is often a work that increasingly helps us to realize our dependency upon Him. Do you understand your weakness this morning, young person? Do you understand your insufficiency in Him? As he's calling us to battle, he says to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's a call to be strong in the Lord. There's a call here, he says, to put on. Notice verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God. This putting on, it's, if you will, an assembly of the troops. 
God is calling. It's a battle cry. And He's calling out to all Christians to stand, to stand, to stand, to continue. If you'll notice in verses 11 and 12, He says that we wrestle against, 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 and against. He says it's a wrestling match. How many of you were wrestlers in high school? Any wrestlers? There's a few. Okay. Wrestling, wrestlers are the ultimate athlete. I'll just say that. Um, they are the dudes, if you will. A wrestling match. It's an unending pressure. It's constant. It's holds. It's pressures. It's submissions. It's not a boxing match where there's blows and blocks and swings and misses. It's a wrestling that takes place. And he says we wrestle against these things. And listen, this is not a game, young people. There is a war that's taking place, and it is a spiritual warfare, a spiritual wrestling match, if you will. And it's constant. There's a constant pressure. And God is calling us to a battle, and he says to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And he says to put on the whole armor of God. Can you see this assembling of the troops? God is calling the troops, and I would say that I'm preaching to to some of the special forces of God's troops. You're here training for a special operation, and God is calling you to battle. He's calling you to a warfare. Would you put on this armor of God as we stand? Look at this list in verse number, beginning in verse number 11, able to stand against the wiles of the devil. As we stand, he says in verse number 12, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he says in all of this, in verse 13, is in the midst of an evil day. An evil day that we live in. May I ask you, are you able to stand? When it's all said and done, having done all, will you stand, teenager, young person? A call to battle. May also say a cause a cause to stand for. Again, look at verse number 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. And notice this next phrase. In the evil day, and having done all to stand. There is a cause to stand for. And that cause that we stand for is the faith. But he says that we must do it in the midst of an evil day. In the evil day. There are those, as I mentioned, who have stood ahead of us in their evil day. You may think that this is an evil day, and it is. And evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. And they are. But your parents also stood in an evil day. And maybe your grandparents stood in an evil day and those before them also stood in an evil day. And all the way back to the days of the Scriptures, there were many who stood in an evil day. And I think of a young man named David who when everyone was fearing, what was David willing to do? He was willing to fight. He understood the battle cry. And when his brothers and all of Saul's army were cowering, he went with courage for the Lord and was willing to say, is there not a cause to stand for? And David said to that giant that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. He understood that there was a cause to stand for in an evil day. Now think of those three Hebrew young men. Hanani, Mishael, Azariah. When everyone else was bowing down, they just bowed up. And they said, we're not going to bow down. Be it known unto thee, O king, we will not bow. 
They said, there's a cause. We're going to stand for it. Our God is able, they said, in an evil day. I think of a Daniel who stood firmly on his knees, praying before his God as he did daily in the midst of an evil day. Or a Joshua, a Joshua in the midst of an evil day who said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me, as for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. He stood when others wouldn't. What about you today? Will you stand in the midst of an evil day? Let me say that an evil day is no excuse to not stand. There's no excuse. In fact, we are called to stand in the midst of an evil day. Would you hold your place here and turn to the book of Jude, that small book? Verse number 3, another familiar verse. Jude is writing and he says, Beloved, in verse number 3, When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, what we have in common in the Lord Jesus Christ, that common salvation, Salvation. Verse number three. He said it was needful. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. He said it was needful in the midst of evil, in the midst of deception, in the midst of those who were preaching deceptive truths, he said it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith. I'm talking about a cause to stand for. That faith which was once delivered, but it must be contended for in every generation. The faith, the faith. It is that, you may have heard it said this way, that irreducible body of truth that we stand upon. The deity of Jesus Christ, His vicarious suffering, His death on the cross, He tasted death for every man. His resurrection as we'll celebrate on Sunday. That He ever lives to make intercession for us. The gospel it's the truth that we stand upon. And Jude said we must earnestly, earnestly contend. It's what we stand on. It's what we stand for. If you look back in Ephesians chapter 6, if you held your spot there, look at verse number 13. Speaking about a cause to stand for. He says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, and notice how he says this, that you may be able to withstand. Would you mark that word in your Bible or in your notes, the word withstand? You see, there's a difference between standing and withstanding. Do you know the difference? Do you understand this? To stand, I can stand here on my own, erect, upright, but to withstand means it, it implies that there is a pressure against. It's the idea of standing against force. See, if I was just standing here flat-footed, it'd be easy to knock me over. But to withstand, you must take your stance. And you must realize that this is a call to battle and that there is a cause to stand for. And as you take your stance upon this faith and you're ready to earnestly contend for the faith, you can withstand in the evil day. Talking about being able to stand. Satan wants to knock you off your place, young person. He wants to move you from your position on what you know is true. There are so many deceptive lies, so many things on the internet, if we're not careful, things that we watch, people that we read after, and if you're not careful, teenager, young person, excuse me, you'll be moved off of your spot. 
You better be ready to withstand. You see, Satan wants to move you off your spot, not because he wants your spot, not because he wants your position, but because he knows the impact of one soldier of God who has moved off of his position. I think of Gideon and his army, and those 300 men, and they encompassed around the enemy, circled around them, and the Bible says, and every man stood in his place. Are you standing in your place today? What about tomorrow? What about when you leave the grounds of this college? Graduate and move on. Can we look back and say that you were still standing, you are still standing in your place? There's a domino effect when one leaves. Think of Gideon and those men. Every man stood in his place. But what if, what if one said, I'm out of here. This is crazy. I'm not standing here. This won't work. What if one left? And there was an empty spot. And the next one, he's influencing the others next to him. And so on and so forth. And not only that, Think of those down the line generationally who will not stand and cannot stand if you don't stand. If you won't stand. Paul understood this pressure to move. But the Apostle Paul said, but none of these things move me. These things, these pressures from without. He said, they don't move me. What would it take to move you? Paul said, none of these things move me. I think we're such weak, wimpy Christians nowadays. What opposition would it take to move me? What discouragement would it take to move you from your position? What temptation would lure you off of your spot? What deception would would draw you away. Paul said, but none of these things move me. Proverbs reminds us, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Don't go meddling. Don't meddle with what's been handed to you. Don't be looking for something new. Don't look for something better. By the way, the truth, you cannot improve upon the truth. There's nothing better than the truth. Just stand on it, preach it, practice it, know it, and just keep standing. Able to stand, he says. There's a pressure to move, but don't move, young person. I'm talking about a call to battle, a cause to stand for. And may I say number three, a capable warrior. Capable warrior. What makes a capable warrior? You may be sizing yourself up right now as I do. Am I able to stand? When it's all said and done, can I do this? Do I have what is in me? Is there enough there to keep standing? Look, this standing, a capable warrior, has nothing to do with ability. Has nothing to do with my own strength has nothing to do with rank or position or courage. It has everything to do with what it says in this passage. Look at verse number 11 again. Excuse me, verse number 10. He says to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See, it's not my ability, but His. If I'm going to be standing, if you're going to be standing... It's because I find my strength in the Lord. Amen. You see, a capable warrior is strong. He is strong in the Lord. Don't look to yourself, young person. You'll be sorely disappointed. When the enemy comes against you, self will cave in quickly. 
But a capable warrior understands that he's strong in the Lord. Joshua was told by the Lord, be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Joshua said, be, he said, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Listen, it's not your own power, but you just stand for God, stand for God, and He will fight for you. Just stand for Him. Stand on the truth. Speaking of a capable warrior, he is strong in the Lord, but he's also suited up in the armor of God. Again, in verse number 11, he says to put on, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor. A capable warrior is strong in the Lord, but he is suited up in the armor of God. And yes, it's powerful. It's supernatural, this, this armor of God. It is a supernatural, powerful armor. But it must be also personal. He says to, look at verse 13 again. He says, take unto you the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand. It must be personal. Look, you have to take it unto you. All of these pieces of the armor, this spiritual, this spiritual equipping, you have to take unto yourself. Listen, your teachers and your professors, they can't equip you with the armor of God. Your parents, they can't equip you with this. They can lay it out there and present it to you, but at some point it must become personal that you take unto yourself the armor of God and this call to battle as he calls us to battle. He says, put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. Every piece of it must be put on. It's powerful. It's personal, but it must be put on. It has to be put to practice. We have to take unto ourselves what he calls here the truth. He says, gird up thy loins with truth. The truth. Buy it, sell it not. This, this belt, if you will, that is the foundation of the whole armor, he says to put it on. It ties it all together, the truth. Let's read on. We won't go into all of it, but look at verse number 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Truth and righteousness. Truth. You're holding it in your lap. You're holding the truth. Lay hold of it. Build your life on it. Tie up everything in your life with it. Wrap the truth around you. And righteousness. This is not my own righteousness, but Christ's. Positionally, you and I are righteous in Him. But practically, He says to put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is right living in the sight of God. It's a breastplate. What is it protecting? It's protecting the heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. You won't survive a heart wound. I'm talking about holy living, righteousness, a breastplate of righteousness. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. I'm speaking about this armor, a capable warrior. The gospel of peace. And notice and mark the word there, the word preparation, the preparation. It speaks of a readiness that we put upon our feet. Are we carrying the gospel? It is our feet that carry this message in our mouth that speaks it. Are you equipped with the gospel message today? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. See, it's our faith. It's our faith 
that blocks the attack of the enemy. Satan cannot overcome faith. You know the verse in 1 John? And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Say it with me. Even our faith. Faith is the victory. It is that victorious shield that we must carry that will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And he says in verse number 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Don't go to battle without the helmet. Don't try to fight this battle without knowing that you know that you're saved. Do you have that assurance of your salvation as you face the pressures of the enemy? Do you want to be able to stand? Then you nail that thing a mile deep in your heart. Let God settle your faith in Him and know that you've put on the helmet of salvation. And He says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword. It's the only weapon we have against the enemy. He talks about against, against, against. What is against us? But then he gives us the weapon that we have against the enemy. It is the word of God in your life. Don't neglect it. L listen, I'll be done in just a moment. I know you're a Bible college student. You're sitting at a Bible college in a chapel service. You're a Bible student. But one of the easiest things to do at Bible college is to neglect your Bible. Because of the schedule, because of the busyness. And you think, well, I'm getting Bible everywhere I turn. Listen, you need the sword of the Spirit. Take it unto you personally. Take it unto you. That ye may be able to stand. And having done all, having done all to stand. Would you bow your heads with me?